him because we trust in his holy name. May your faithful love rest on us, Lord, for we put our hope in you. This is the word of the Lord. And if you're new here, uh, normally we have one of our head pastors, uh, Alex or Ricky, preach, but this morning we get the opportunity to hear from Trent Marshall. He's a, a worship resident with us. So as a church, we're, uh, you know, our mission is to multiply disciples and churches, and so part of that is just raising up future ministers. So we look forward to hearing from Trent this morning. Amen. You guys can grab a seat. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, Thanksgiving is over. Gluttony is officially a sin again. You know, some of you probably took advantage of that one. I know I did, but just so we're clear. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm Trent. Uh, super happy to be with you guys. I'm super excited. Um, I'm a ministry resident here, as he said. And so, um, yeah, I'm super excited to kick us off into our Advent season. And so it is Advent season. And if you're anything like me and you have somewhat of a church background, you probably know a little bit about what Advent is. Uh, you're probably familiar with, yet we just sang some Christmas songs, right? We lit the candle, right? There's these traditions that we associate with Advent. Um, but Advent, the word Advent actually means arrival or appearing. And so all of these traditions and all the things that we do actually point us to the arrival or the coming of Jesus. The fact that God the Father sent God the Son to earth to uh, dwell among us in, in sinlessness and ultimately take our debt of sin and save us to a relationship with himself. And, and to help us focus on this this Sunday and for the next four Sundays, we're going to focus on these historical realities, these virtues of our faith. And so today we're going, to, we're going to be centered on hope. But all of them are pointing us to the fact that our creator became the created. And practically speaking, uh, what, what this helps us see is that Chris, it, like it helps us understand what Christmas is about, right? Like I think sometimes, in, especially in Christian circles, we're like, yeah, we know. Christmas is not about Santa, right? We, we got that down. But, but if you actually look at our actions, right, sometimes it's still like, ah, we, we're with family and we're doing these things to celebrate and we get Christmas gifts. And oh, yeah, it's about, like, it's about Jesus, right? And we get, the, we get all our, our kind of traditions and our fun things and it's like Jesus is tacked on. And what Advent helps us do is kind of swap that, right? And it says, Jesus came to earth. Our creator became the created, and we can tack on those other things to help us celebrate. And so that's what Advent does, and, and we're going we're gonna to lean into that. And, and I just want to acknowledge for a second, um, when we start to talk about Christmas, I think there can be a broad array of emotional responses, right? Some of you have had your decorations up since like Halloween. You're excited. You're like, yes, it's finally here. And then some of us are feeling maybe a little bit, ugh, Christmas is here. I don't know. If, right? It, like there's a broad array of emotions. And I just want to encourage you, if you're on the ugh side of it, right, you're, you're kind of like, yeah, it's here again. I don't know how I feel about it. I just want to encourage you, like when we think of the gospel message, right, it's pretty easy to get excited, to get hyped up for, for what we celebrate on Easter. When we think of the, the gospel message, it's like Jesus, Jesus died. He died for our sins, he rose again on the third day. Like, because of the act of Jesus, we have access to the Father, and we get it for eternity, right? And, and I just want to encourage you, like, when we say the gospel, like, this is not outside of that. Like, what we celebrate on Christmas is the fact that our, our, our King, our Creator, came down from glory. And so um, I just encourage you that, like, this is every bit as important to the gospel message, and it deserves our attention. And so that's my encouragement for you this morning. Um, as we start our Advent season on hope, right, we talked about hope earlier, um, we're going to be centering ourselves on hope. And so the question is, what is hope? Um, like, what do you think of when you think of hope? And I think typically, the way that we think about hope, the word hope, is, is kind of like synonymous with want or wish. And so if you say, I hope something, you could normally switch out the word hope right there, and you could replace it with want or wish, and, the, and the, the meaning of what you're saying wouldn't change. And so an example would be if you said, I hope I get the promotion at my work. You could say, I want to get the promotion at work, right? The meaning doesn't change there. And so um, I hope the weather's good. I want the weather to be good. Same meaning. I, I hope my team wins the game. I want my team to win the game. And so we do this type of hoping all the time, and it, really it's a regular part of most of our lives. Now, as I was thinking about hope, um, 
I, I'm always amazed at, at people that have outdoor weddings. Um, if you can pull one off, they're, they're awesome. The pictures are beautiful, right? Outdoor weddings are crazy cool. But what's the one factor that determines if an outdoor wedding works or not? The weather, yeah, the weather, right? I think we've all heard the horror stories, or maybe we've been there on the, the outdoor weddings where, where the wind is blowing 20 miles an hour or the bride is sweating through her dress because it's 107 degrees out, right? That's terrible. And, but the best that the bride and groom can do for an outdoor wedding is hope that the weather is good, right? And so this helps us kind of draw out what I mean when we talk about hope. And, and you see this, this kind of hope it's a, it's a wishful thinking. It's a, it's a wish upon a star, cross our fingers type of hope. And really, when it comes to some things, right, this hope is fine. If you're hoping that your team wins, that's great. That, that, that's, I'm, not, I'm not trying to downplay that. But here's what I want us to see. As the importance and the value of the thing that you're hoping for goes up, the less we want our our fingers to be crossed, right? The less we want that type of wishful thinking hope as the importance goes up. And so um, here's an example. If you're, like, if you're saying, I hope my team wins, although it may not feel like it, whether or not your team wins doesn't have a ton of bearing on your life as a whole, right? You can cross your fingers, and if it doesn't work out in the, in the, in the, in the scope of your life, you're going to be okay, right? But if you're saying, I hope that the weather for my outdoor wedding is good. That's quite a bit more important, right? That day is a big day for your life. And so as you see, like the value of the thing goes up, the importance, the less we want that kind of to- type of hope. And so here's my question for us this morning. Is this the type of hope that we want when it comes to our lives? Like is it, when it comes to the things that ultimately matter, do we want to wish upon a star and cross our fingers? Or do we want a hope that's dependable? Do we want a hope that gives us a confident assurance? And in the end, here's the difference. Do we want to be wishing or do we want to be knowing? So here's the reality for us this morning. Your hope is only as good as what it rests in. Catch this. What your hope rests in or the the object of your hope is what determines the legitimacy and dependability of your hope. And so we could take a few examples from earlier. When we say, I hope my team wins... That's not a bad thing to want, but is it dependable? No, it's not. And why? It's because the thing that you're hoping in is the team, right? And the team is up against all sorts of factors, all of which are unpredictable and and unstable, right? And so you, you can't depend on it because you're hoping in your team, and your team is up against too much to actually be dependable. I hope the weather's good. Not a bad thing to want, but is it dependable? No. Why? Because even, in the, like, even if there's a solid forecast, we've all seen the weather change, right? There's, there's factors that play into it that are all unstable and unpredictable. And so if the object of our hope determines the dependability of our hope, then the question we have to answer is this. Is there any object out there in which we can place our hope that is actually truly trustworthy? And I'm here to tell you this morning that there is. Hebrews 6.19 refers to a hope that is an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Romans 5.5 says that we have a hope that will not disappoint us. And so what is the hope that these passages refer to? A hope that sounds really drastically different, obviously, right? in, In Hebrews, it says it's an anchor for the soul. An anchor is firm. It's secure. It's not going anywhere, right? An anchor, a hope that won't disappoint us. And the only place that that kind of hope can be found, the only place that that hope exists, is not in an object, but a person and a person of hope. God and his love expressed to us through Jesus Christ is the only anchor for our lives. And so this, moment, this morning, my, my main point is simply this. We're, we're not, we're not going to do a lot of, like, like, I'm not going to crazy lengths. It's pretty simple. Your hope for life needs to be in God. That's my main point this morning. And so if you'd open up your Bibles to Psalm 33, we're going we're gonna to be based in verses 16 through 22. That's what we read just a little bit ago. Um, and, and I simply just want us to see 
from the text, we're going to see two reasons that your hope needs to be in God. And, and we're going to focus, like I said, in 16 through 22. However, to give you a feel for what's going on in the psalm up to this point, th- this psalm is, is a psalm that really centers on seeing God as, as worthy of, of our praise and worthy of our worship. And it starts off with an exhortation to praise God. And, and then it progresses into why we should. It says he's trustworthy. Then it talks about all that God has done and all he's created and done in the world and how he rules over all the earth. Then look with me at verse 13. It says, The Lord looks down from heaven. He observes everyone. He gazes on all the inhabitants of the earth from his dwelling place. He forms the hearts of them all. He considers all their works. So it says that God is over everything and thus observes everything. And what does God see when he looks? So, so think about this. God God observes, God sees. What does he see when God looks? Verse 16, a king is not saved by a large army. A warrior is not rescued by great strength. The horse is a false hope for safety. It provides no escape by its great power. Reason number one that your hope needs to be in God, you can write this down if you're taking notes. Reason number one, everything else over promises, but under delivers. And so this psalm is a, is a psalm written by King David. And in the time of David, countries and really entire civilizations, they, they rose and they fell on the basis of military power, right? And this is not just a concept that we find in the Bible. Like we can trace this concept throughout world history from, from Attila and the Huns to Alexander the Great, right? What did they have in common? Yes, they, they were great leaders. Yes, they had effective strategies and tactics. Why? But, but what they had, most of all, was great military power. Every country that has ever existed has either risen or fallen on the basis of military power. And, and just think, like if, if the country next to you, if you're in this time, if the country next to you ha- had, had a bigger army, you're probably going down, right? It's just the reality. But if you do, you're, gonna, you're probably going to take them and you, you're going to prosper, right? And so... And like even think, if you're a warrior, with this, this passage, we're going to talk a lot about the king and the warrior because it talks about those two things. And like if you're the warrior, do you want big biceps or do you want noodle arms, right? Like I want to be jacked if I'm, if I'm in this, like, like nobody's thinking that, right? So, um, and I also just specifically to horses, like these were an incredible asset in that day. In that day. They, they took a man that would have been relatively slow, susceptible to getting tired, right? and weak, and it gave him a ride. That would have saved energy. It would have given him speed either for attack or escape. A horse could take a relatively weak, slow man and give him an advantage over a man that was like had some, some like twice the skill, twice the, twice the speed, twice the strength. A horse could do that for somebody. And, and, and by the way, my, I, my suspicion is that the elders gave me a text with horses in it because they wanted me to tell a, a personal story about horses. So I don't, I don't know if that's true, but if, if it is, Alex, I just here, here's your personal story. So I grew up on a ranch. Um, at, some of you know that. And, and the reality of growing up on a ranch is that I have been riding horses since I was about three years old. And one of the very first lessons that you learn about riding horses is that a horse is best and most well utilized when you trust them. When you trust them. And so, and so b- because the reality is there, there's enough going on, give, depending on what you're doing, there's enough going on that if you're trying to worry about things that the horse really is, is kind of in the horse's realm, like you're a team. If you're worrying about things like that, you're not going to have enough, enough like, energy. You're not going to have enough mind power to be able to think about what you need to do. Okay, so here's an example. Sometimes you need to, like, if you've got a lot of ground to cover, you need to trot or you need to lope your horse to get there quicker. You don't have enough time in the day. You need to get there, right? Well, what's the problem with that? You need to, like, because you're going at a faster pace, you can't look for every little gopher hole. You can't look for every little branch. You can't look for every little obstacle that the horse might trip on, right? And so what's required of you, if you want to do that, if you want to get your job done, is that you have to trust that your horse, who was created by an intentional God, who knew what he was doing, who was born in that environment, who has, um, who has the design to be able to watch for those things on his own, can actually do that. And so what, what I found, and, and this was a, it was a fairly difficult lesson to learn. It's scary. You're up, on, you're up off the ground, right? But if, if things go bad, it could really go bad. 
But what I found in my personal experience is that a horse can actually be trusted. A horse can actually be trusted. I've, like, literally, I, it sounds, maybe it sounds like hick or something, but, like, literally, a horse is super trustworthy. And so um, what I'm trying to draw out here is that horses, armies, strong men, like, all of these things are legitimately, like, good things that provide legitimate hope. They, they, they're, like, legitimately trustworthy. And so here's the problem, though. If you, if you look back at our text, what does it say? Like, everything that I just told you contradicts what I, like, I, the text and me are, are in contradiction here. It says a king is not saved by a large army. A warrior will not be rescued by great strength. A horse is a false hope for safety. And so what's the principle for us then? It's this. Even great, mighty, dependable, logical things don't provide legitimate hope. In fact, what they do is they overpromise, but they underdeliver. And so the question has to be asked, why do they underdeliver? If it makes sense, if it's logical, why do they underdeliver? And it goes back to the needs of the people. So again, we're in verses 16 and 17. It's because the king, what's he looking for? He's looking for salvation. The warrior is looking for rescue. He's looking for safety and escape. But when you dilute these things down, what they're really searching for is satisfaction, right? Like in the search for salvation, what, what, he's, what the king is looking for is a satisfaction from the fear of death. He's tired. He doesn't want to feel that way. He's looking to be satisfied from that feeling of death. He wants to be saved. Satisfaction from the lingering feeling of discomfort. It's the feeling of longing in their souls that seeks relief. And sure, these, these things can do some good. They can do some good, but, but they really only provide hope for a moment. Their, their needs can't be quenched by these things. And so the question for us then is this. What great, mighty, dependable, logical, good thing are you putting your hope in? Like, like where, what are you looking to, to satisfy yourself? The, the longing that, like, the longing that you feel for, for, for these things, right? When you need safety, what, what are you looking towards? And so here's a few specific questions to help you think about this. Uh, number one, what is outside of me that I'm putting my hope in? Um, what is outside of me that I'm putting my hope in? And so for the king, in our, in our example, the, his army was, was an outside force, right? It was outside of himself. And so um, we could ask ourselves, what is outside of me that I'm putting my hope in? And, and a really direct application from the text is, are you putting your hope in the military power of our country, right? That, that might be more relevant for some people than others, but are you putting your hope there? It could be your 401k, could be your career success, could be, could be school success. Like, th- think, put yourself, put yourself in this scenario for a second. Think if, if you walked out of this room after, after this sermon, you're probably thinking, uh, we gotta get the, we got to get the kids, we got to get lunch figured out, We're, we got the next thing, probably got to prepare for the week ahead. You pull your phone out of your pocket, and you have a text from your boss, and it says, hey, uh, sorry, but, but because of X, Y, Z circumstances, unfortunately, we're going to have to let you go. We're going to we're gonna have to um, let you go, and you're fired, right? Think about, like, Put, your, put yourself in that situation. What would your reaction be? Like, and I'm not saying that you, like, I don't think anybody would be happy about getting that text, right? Like nobody, I'm not, so I'm not saying you can't feel the emotion of it, but would, but, but would it well up something in you that, that would like bring some obvious significant panic, right? Is your hope in your job. Another source of outside hope could be your relationships, your spouse, your friends, your kids. Something, something that I know I'm super guilty of is, is I'll come home after, after a long day and um, my, you know, I'll get home and my wife will say, hey, how, how was your day? And 20 minutes later, when, I, when I'm done uh, you know, unloading all of my junk and my emotions on her, it's like you know, it, it, she's, she's probably had a long day too. And you know, guess what? Like, sometimes that's the reality of marriage. Sometimes you just, you just bear each other's burdens. But what happens if I do that to my wife when she's also had a tough day, right? 
If I'm overly dependent on my wife to help me deal with my emotions and feel okay after a hard day, that's, that's actually super unhealthy. Like her, my, my, my spouse's shoulders are not meant to carry the full weight of, like, of me, of my, of my emotions, of my junk that, that I carry. And so um, that's just an example. Like your spouse, your relationships, their shoulders aren't meant to carry the full weight of, of, of your well-being, of your satisfaction. And the list could go on and on, right? There's lots of things, um, from sports to, to popularity to money to the status of your following, follower ratio on Instagram, right? There's a lot of things we could look to. Just like the king, you're going to look to things outside yourself for hope. And just like the king, none of these things will give you what you're looking for. The second question is, what is inside of me that I'm putting my hope in? Uh, for the warrior, he had great strength, and that was something that was inside of him. And so it could, could literally be your own strength, right? Um, it could be your work ethic. Maybe you're, maybe you're just a really tenacious, hardworking person, and you get a lot done. What's inside of you? Um, the other day, I got challenged. I was at high school youth group, and I got challenged to a, a race by a high school student. And, and blinded by my pride and, and some delusion, I accepted the challenge. And I'll spare you the details, but... Uh, I'll just say this, I am officially in the can't race without falling down stage of, of my life. And so the cement out front is not very kind to your, your body if you're racing. So anyway, just like me, this is kind of a silly example, but just like me, like you're going to fail yourself. And obviously, that, again, that's a kind of a goofy example, but, but we fail ourselves, right? What you have that's inside of you is not a good hope for you. The third question what means of escape do I put my hope in? And so uh, our text says that the horse was an escape. And it says it's a false hope of escape. And so for me, the, the first place that I go to is, is things that, that, that numb us out, right? And, and for me, I really struggle with my phone, with Netflix, right? And, and, and I get it. Like, we want to we wanna unwind. When we get home, we think, oh, this is going to be super restful. It's easy to just pull out the phone or, or whatever. But, but, like, are you going to those things to avoid a hard conversation. Like, are you, are you doing that rather than investing in your relationships in your life? Um, could be alcohol. And, and, and maybe it's not even like you, you over drink every time. Maybe you don't, but maybe you just go to that first, right? You think it'll help, but, but in all reality, it, it just doesn't, right? Where do you look for a form of escape? And I just ask you, here, here's, a, here's a follow-up question to help us process this. Like, where do you go when you're angry? Where do you go when you're anxious? Where do you go when you're stressed, feeling unwanted? Honestly, ask yourself that. As I've studied this passage, something that's been incredibly convicting for me is to see the amount of hope that I've placed in people's opinions of me. Um, I, I, I really, really, really want people to like me, and it's just, it's the, it's the, it's the truth, and, and it drives a shameful amount of my motivation on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the other day we were downtown and there was a, we were eating lunch and there was, a, there was a homeless man outside of the restaurant that we were at and I felt the Holy Spirit prompting me to go just engage with him and I don't know what it could have led to but engage with him nonetheless and I, I chose not to for the reason that I felt like the people that I was with would think that I was trying to be some you know, over-spiritualized, holy, you know, engage with the, like, I, I don't know, it was, it's such a, me like, even as I verbalize it, it's such a messed up thought, but, but what ruled me in that moment was the fear of what the people I was with would think. That kept me from, from doing something that's really good, that's really, like, that, that the Bible would condone as, or, or uh, condone? They encourage, yeah, the Bible would encourage as, like, worthy ministry, right? And, and, and the question that I've been forced to ask myself is, is how's that working out for you, Trent? Like, how is the, the, the idol, the hope of other people's opinions of you working out for me? And, and, and I just ask you the same question, like, as we've talked about what's outside of you, what's inside of you, what do you look for, for escape? Like, how's that working out for you? How's that working out for you? And I'm guessing you would say something like, yeah, it, it, I, it over promises, but it under delivers. And so... The first reason that your hope needs to be in God is because everything else overpromises but underdelivers. But lucky for us, that's not the end of the story. Would you read verse 18 and 19 with me? 
It says, but look, the Lord keeps his eye on those who fear him, those who depend on his faithful love to rescue them from death and to keep them alive in famine. The second reason you need to put your hope in God is because he promises and he delivers. He promises and delivers. And so track with me. God created everything, right? That's what we kind of brought out of verses 13 through 15. He's over everything. He sees everything. So like, take a second to think about that. Every single thing like, that you've ever seen, that you've ever heard of, that anyone from the beginning of earth until now has ever seen or heard of, right? From the most intricate, tiny details of the way that the human body works to the widest expanses of the galaxy that no telescope will ever be able to see, our God is over that. He created it. He rules over it. And what does God choose to keep his eye on? Said another way, what does God choose to give his attention to, this God who is so big? Our text says, those who fear him, those who depend on his faithful love. And so fear here just means reverence and devotion. And so those who are devoted to God, those who depend on his faithful love, that's where God's attention is. That's where he keeps his eye. God is not just a ruler and a creator, and he's not this high and mighty and thus removed from us type God. But, but on the contrary, one of the most frequent ways that scripture helps us understand God is by referring to him as a father, right? That's Jesus called him heavenly father. He's our heavenly father. And, and that's the picture that we have here. That's the picture that, that the text is drawing out for us. Like imagine a loving father that looks at their young child as they crawl, walk, play. That child, that child can offer almost nothing to his father. And yet, the father's attention is just completely consumed with his child. That's the picture that we get of God here. But that's not all. Verse 19 says that this God who keeps his eye, what does he do? He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in famine. And so we see that this God that we speak of here is not some far off God. No, he's a faithful father who acts and who moves. But what does he do? He rescues from death and sustains during famine. But more specifically, he gives what is needed. And so this is really cool. This is really cool. So track with me. If you recall, our king and our warrior, what did they need? Right? They needed saved. They needed rescued. They had a yearning for those things. They had a longing to be satisfied. What does God do? God rescues from death. Do you see that, that where they were left longing, where the army couldn't provide, God does. Like God fills the need. God fills the longing. The warrior, he needed safety and escape. God keeps alive during famine. The idea here is that he not only saves, but God sustains. He's filling the needs. So listen. We can make some eye contact. Each and every one of us has needs that are provided for in the promise of verse 19. The deep longings of the soul are satisfied in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. This is the character of our God. He is truly dependable. He is genuinely worthy of our hope. And so those are our two observations. And so the, the way, that, the way that, that we're going to, we still have three verses left. Um, we, have, we have 20, 21, 22. And so those last three verses, if, if you have a bulletin, there's just a spot for like three outcomes. And so what we're going to see is that, it, like what, we have, what we've already seen is that nothing else works. It, it over promises and under delivers. God promises and he delivers. And so the last three verses give us three outcomes of what it looks like to have our faith in God. The first one is in verse 20, and it says this, we wait for the Lord. He is our help and shield. And so when we have something that is worthy of our hope, one of the main outcomes that we have is just an ability to wait. It's to be patient. Why do we wait? And maybe better ask, how can we wait? Because he is our help and our shield. From start to finish, the Bible is full of evidence that though trials come to those in the world, God is faithful to provide for his people. We can wait for the Lord, and that's the first outcome of a true hope. The second outcome of a true hope from verse 21 
It says, for our hearts rejoice in him because we trust in his holy name. And so the second response of having a God like ours is that we can rejoice. And, and the word rejoice, it just means to feel or to show great joy or delight. And like, I love this because what better response is there than to have a great joy at the fact that our God is trustworthy. Like, if we don't have a God that is trustworthy, then our faith as a whole is a sham, right? And so the fact that our God is trustworthy, that's kind of a buzzword that we throw around. But like, think about the fact that our God is trustworthy. That means that we're not going to be let down. That means that every, like, that means that we have a hope that is truly dependable. And so what other reaction should we have than to rejoice, right? Rejoice, rejoicing flows naturally out of our God whose gaze is locked, locked on those who depend him. He's overall, but he rescues his children from death and he sustains them. What a joyous matter that we have a true hope that will not let us down. Amen? Yeah. The third, the third outcome of having a true hope from verse 22, it says, may your faithful love rest on us, Lord, for we put our hope in you. The last outcome of this hope is that we can ask God for more. And this is kind of a, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing because the, the tone of the psalmist changes here. It's, it's less of like, a, it's less of him saying something and it, and it turns, the, 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 the direction of his message is no longer like towards us, the reader, it's towards God. And so, and so what we draw out of this last verse, it's a prayer where he says, may your faithful love rest on us, Lord, for we put our hope in you. And so he, he's presenting a prayer to God. And so, and so what, what we've got here, the outcome is that we've got access to a God that we can ask for more, right? That he would continue to refresh us with his love. This is a prayer that says, God, continually remind me of your love for me. What we've gained is access to this faithful, saving, moving, seeing God. So here's what I want us to see. These aren't just fluffy Christian words. These aren't just like feel-good things that we tell ourselves around Christmas time. These are actual real truths of our God. We should be asking ourselves, however, like if God is these things, what does that look like tangibly? Because these are, these are great things, but, but there's sort of been a tone for, for the entirety of, of, since I've been up here, there's sort of been a tone where we haven't really gotten into like the nitty gritty of what does that look like that God is these things? We should be asking ourselves, what does this look like tangibly? What does this look like tangibly? But the answer is beautifully tangible. It's beautifully tangible. In the most tangible way possible, God sent his son from his heavenly dwelling place to dwell on the earth. He not only formed the hearts of his, of his inhabitants of the earth, right? Verse 15 says he formed the hearts of the inhabitants of earth, but he actually formed the actual beating heart of his own son in the womb of Mary. Why did he do this? Why? Why, why, why send his son to earth? Because God's eye was, has been, still is. God's eye, God's attention has been on his people. And what did he see as he looked on his people? He saw people that sinned, that rebelled, that constantly and in every single way fell short of his glory. They were perishing and they could do nothing to stop it. Every law, every circumstance, every prophet that God gave in order to turn his people back to himself didn't work. And, and think, we just got done preaching through the book of Nehemiah. And this is like, what I'm saying right here is literally the story of Nehemiah. God raised up a, a man named Nehemiah, and he said, restore the wall. And then he said, restore the people. And so this man, Nehemiah, did, did everything from, he was, a, he was a construction manager for a wall, to a pastor to these people, to like an MMA dude that was smacking people for being crazy, right? Like this man, like Nehemiah, gave all of his effort and Every effort, every piece of reform that Nehemiah could offer left the people unchanged. Why? Because, because their hearts weren't changed. That's what we talked about last week. Their hearts weren't changed. And so as God looks on his people, this is what he sees. And he said, the way that I'm going to rescue them from death and sustain them in life is only through 
a loving act of sending his son to earth to do for his people what they could never do for themselves. But the question for us this morning is, where is your hope? The fact is, we will put our hope somewhere. It'll be in something. And I just want to say very clearly this morning that the only true hope that you or I will ever have access to is Jesus. It's Christ. Earlier when I talked about the longings of the soul, like we talked about like how, how, how the, the king and the warrior were, were longing to be satisfied. Did that, did that resonate with anyone? Like the thought, the, the thought of the feeling, the wanting, the longing, right? And, and what we drew out is that everything that we kind of try to fill in that, that we try to fill that longing with, it falls short, right? Jesus in Luke 6 tells a parable of two men who build houses. One is built on the stone and one is built on the sand. Both houses face wind, they, fi- they face the rain, they face the floods. They face trials, but which one stands? The one one that's built on the rock, right? And that rock is Christ. Which one fell? The one that was built on the sand. And so if your hope is in your army, if your hope is in your strength, if your hope is in in your horse, (laughs) your your, your house is built on sand, and and it's gonna fall. And it's not just if the waves and the wind and the trials come, it's just when. If your house is built on anything but the solid rock of Christ, it will eventually fall. It won't withstand the strong forces of the trials of this life. Is your hope in the resources in your life or the source of life? That's the question for us. This morning, if you're not a Christian, if you're, if you're, if you're not someone who's, who's submitted your life to Christ, I, just, I want you to know that there's a spiritual reality to who you are. Like God created you. And he created you intentionally. He created you with a soul. Romans 3.23 tells us that we have all sinned and thus fallen short of the glory of God. And that means that you are made by God, but that your sin has separated you from that God. But in Jesus, in Jesus, salvation has been earned for you. That means that you get access back to this God. When our foundation is built on the rock, which is Christ, when the hardships of life come, we have a hope that will not fail us. And if you're someone who would say, yeah, I'm a Christian, I, I, my hope is in Christ, I would, just, I would just ask you to consider what it would look like to take action from our passage today. And, and it could be something like relatively simple, maybe just like the psalmist in verse 22. You just, you just, need, to, you just need to ask God to help you have hope in him, Right? Even if you're a Christian, you probably, like me, identified some things where it's like, man, I put my hope in that all too often, and it lets me down. Why do I keep going there? Just ask God. Ask God to help you with that. Maybe it's just talk to someone. Tell them you've been struggling. You realize your hope, you know, is is in something wrong. Um, Regardless of who you are this morning, this Christmas season, we'd, we'd be reminded that this is a time to reflect that Jesus came for you, and because of this, we have a hope that will never fall short. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you that you are a true hope for us. God, thank you that, that we, we have the scripture that can, that can point us to these realities that we feel so deeply. God, I just pray for, for the men and women in this room that if they've identified things that, that are falling short in some major ways, that, that their hope is in, that, that are just continuing to leave them wanting more, that, that are over-promising and under-delivering, God, I just ask that you would help them, that you would lead them to put their hope and their trust in you, God. Lord, thank you for Christmas. Thank you for the reality that, that, that in, a, in the most tangible way we can imagine you sent your son to do for us what we couldn't do, and, and, and now we have a solid hope, a type of hope that doesn't leave us wishing but, but knowing. God, thank you for your love. In your-